Good morning, everybody, and welcome to day two, See Our Space with Navair. We appreciate all of you being here. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers today, so check in with us throughout the day. Uh, once our speaker is finished, after each presentation, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions in the room. We're also coming to you, uh, we're here live, we're also coming to you virtually on LinkedIn, so we are taking questions from there as well, so make sure you can tune in there too today. All right, so our first speaker today is Major General Greg Mazziello. He is the Program Executive Officer for Air Anti-Submarine Warfare, Assault, and Special Missions Programs. Sir, welcome to Booth. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. Let's go to the next slide. And this is the, uh, I know some of you saw previous presentations. This is really my only slide. I got one more, but uh, this is the one we're going to talk about. This is PEOA, uh, sort of a pinwheel, 10 different program offices, and a ton of stuff going on. And uh, I'm going to start with the special missions uh, programs, if you will. Probably on the scale of important things to our nation, uh, our TACMO and our new program, the EXX, which will replace the E6, uh, or take a fair amount of time, as they should, as we're trying to get that program off and going correctly. Um, the VH program, most people are familiar with, uh, that's going extremely well. The squadron has four aircraft uh, today of the VH-92, as we have started the transition out of the legacy aircraft. Went through uh, iot &E, OPAVAL, if you will, earlier in the year. Uh, we have that. The um, fleet is trained and ready to go, and we're working with the White House military office on the, the timeline for introduction into in-service, if you will. But the squadron already has it and is operating, so that's all positive. Now I'm going to go back to the 12 o'clock, and I'm going to talk about the uh, MPRA and our uh, anti-submarine warfare from the air. As you know, uh, if you've been following the news, that's kind of a, uh, a hot commodity uh, in particular. If you, the PMA 264 working our sonar buoys, that is uh, their high demand uh, for obvious reasons around the globe. We've got a lot going on inside that small program office, a couple of OTAs, competitions, on uh, all of these items, as well as future opportunities of where we're gonna go uh, for our undersea uh, acoustics. All of that is uh, rolled up into the platforms that you see on the right, the, the P8 primarily, um, and also the H60s. And the P8, we've, uh, we've got a lot going on in our domestic fleet, as well as our increment three that we're working on to bring that uh, up to its I'll say full capability. And also this is where I'd, I guess I'd start talking about our international uh, sales and customers. A very positive trend with the P8. We have a close partnership. It's a cooperative program office with the Australians, both that and the, uh, the 60 program office. But it's not just, there are other FMS customers um, on the P8. We're looking forward to working closely with Germany and, uh, and NATO as well. On the H60 program, they uh, not only are one of our largest uh, fleets for the U.S. Navy out there in terms of our aircraft, but they also are one of our most robust uh, FMS customers. I think we're up to 14 different uh, nations over this past COVID year, which has obviously been difficult. We've expanded the H60 community by three additional partner nations in there and their capability. So, that program office is uh, is working full time with uh, you know India, Greece. I could continue, but then I'll leave somebody else, so I'll stop. Um, and then the only other one that I'd point out, particularly on the on the H60, is maritime strike future vertical lift. So the EXX and the future vertical lift in the H60 and in the um, H1 program. That's kind of our, our new and emerging technology, where we're gonna go, the future of our aviation. And if you went to the you know other programs and other speakers, I know Zulu Corey talked here yesterday. Um, I think there's a lot with our FVL program that we will be working, not necessarily, we should not be working in stovepipes for maritime strike, 
for the Aura, the attack utility replacement aircraft on the Marine Corps, and MUX. And I, uh, if I listened correctly, Zulu talked yesterday a little bit about that arena. And I think if you look at the requirements, uh, which we have done previously and done a Venn diagram, if you will, of the requirements of MUX as it was, uh, not MUX mail really in its current instantiation, but the overarching requirements. You look at the FVL from the Aura as well as Maritime Strike. And if you make that even emerging new requirements, as I understand them, we need to put those all in a Venn diagram. There's a huge overlap. And I think there's the ability to optimize and not go down a bunch of separate stovepipes. That said, we may end up in different stovepipes and we should leverage the technology that we would get in the middle and spread that across. The commonality across those programs, the combination of the, the manned and the unmanned. So this portfolio uh, is manned platforms, but I think the mission sets that, well, I already know, you know, the MPRA, you have Triton as well involved. You have Fire Scout inside the, the neighborhood. There, we're already merging the communities, and I think we'll be merging some of the programs uh, in the future as well. Okay, uh, then I'll move over to V22. Probably the biggest news on the V22 at the moment is uh, the United States Navy. Uh, we have just completed really the operational uh, evaluation uh, uh, completing, and then we're going to go out on the first deployment. And uh, so that's exciting. Uh, I, I certainly have a, uh, a background in V-22 in the past. It's our largest, you know, portfolio uh, as far as footprint of aircraft on the, it, you know, between the H-60s and the V-22s as far as number of airframes. Most of those are in the Marine Corps. There are nine aircraft today that are DD-250 and in the Navy's possession. And we'll be going out on the first uh, deployment on the Vincent here shortly. And uh, I think that's an exciting opportunity, not just for V-22 or for the program office, but actually for our fleet. Uh, it's a new and expanded capability that will uh, be fielded as the COD replacement. But as most of us have seen that platform perform in different roles, I think, uh, over time, we'll see the Navy expand its utility of that aircraft. So really looking forward to that. The, uh, the fleet looks ready. We're working uh, tightly with industry on that uh, first deployment. It's, it should be uh, a good run. Okay, now 53K. So we have 53 Echoes, the MH, and we have the CH, the 53K to replace the CH. Uh, the Navy is going to replace the mine sweeping with other means than uh, a helicopter, that's the current plan. And then we will we'll phase out of the MH53 uh, program in the coming years. The 53 Echo will continue to take the heavy lift for the Marine Corps for uh, a little bit as we now phase in the 53K. Similar to uh, the first four aircraft that I talked about with the VH, we have the first four aircraft on the 53K and the Marines will, I think, deploy this weekend to uh, 29 Palms to begin their iot &E operational test. So that's, that's a big deal, it's a big step in the program, bigger when they complete it, but uh, it's, it's awesome. And I gotta tell you, so the questions that I normally get about the 53K, the, the ones that I like to refer them to are the pilots that have flown it. Uh, they, I believe that maybe it's unfortunate that it's called a 53 and maybe there's some similarity in the pictures. That is an entirely different aircraft uh, from the flight handling controls, the capacity, the capability. I, I will, it's a generational leap in our rotorcraft uh, and, and the aircraft. So that's very exciting. That feedback is more than clear from the pilots uh, and the maintainers as they work on it. So now it's, does the glossy brochure that we have worked for years, we've designed the 53K best on the lessons that we've learned from other aircraft. So does, does that prove out in reality? Uh, we bought an aircraft, I think uh, previous years, we skipped last year, but before we bought 
unlike any other program, we bought the first aircraft, delivered it to the fleet not to fly. This was a couple of years ago as a log demo. And we put it on the flight line in New River and had the Marines assemble, disassemble, go through all the pubs. They gave us plenty of feedback, some on tools, some on tooling, some on procedures, incorporated that all out. These are all lessons that we would be learning now in OPAVAL or even on the first deployment. Um, so I think we have a head start in a very positive direction on, on that program. That takes me around to uh, PMA 207. The largest platform in here as far as number of aircraft are the C-130s. But if I have my numbers right, there's uh, 178 aircraft over 23 different type model series. They're not all pictured here uh, in there in the different variants. So a very busy program office. Uh, I probably get more texts over the weekend from 207 than I do from any of the others. Um, and a lot of times that's the one-off aircraft that we have somewhere that uh, they're just giving me a heads up on something. Uh, with respect to the C-130s, we are continuing down the, uh, the production path on the new Js. The Marine Corps is all in, obviously, on the C-130Js. The Navy has not yet transitioned. We uh, previously have talked about how they went down a different path. We're doing the mods on, uh, on their, their legacy C-130s, which are good, and they're performing well. Um, but we're also expanding that C-130 capability, not in 207, but back to the EXX. And you can see the shadow of the aircraft. That is the plan for our E-6 replacement, our Tacomo. Um, it is not going to be the mission that some people saw years ago in the 80s when we had a C-130 with a roll-on, roll-off. Uh, this is going to be an integrated solution on a C-130 based on the Stretch J, and we're working closely uh, with all of the vendors for the stuff that goes in the back, as well as Lockheed Martin on the aircraft up front. We're going through a risk reduction phase to make sure that that strategy is the smart and prudent one. Highly uh, important program. We want to make sure we get it right. So we're going to purchase three experimental uh, aircraft, which are C-130s uh, up front, and do that risk reduction work to make sure that we have everything flushed out before we roll in uh, we're doing the same thing for the mission package in the back. So that was a relatively quick lap uh, around the wheel, uh, if you will. I could spend the allotted amount of time. By the way, I purposely didn't wear a watch, uh, so I'm not looking at it. Uh, any one of these programs or multiple programs inside the program office, we could spend our whole time. Uh, but I wanted to give you a, an overview of, of where we are. The priorities inside of PEOA have not changed. That's readiness, uh, you know, is number one. We're, we're addressing that through material and non-material changes on the flight line. And the non-material changes, I will say, are at least as important as any of the material changes that we do. Now, for all the vendors that make different gear, it's the reliability of the individual components that I want to highlight with you. For the entirety of the fleet, it really is, how do we treat these machines? Uh, some of these are relatively expensive. Uh, they're highly technical. We're training our workforce in the Marine Corps and in the Navy and our other services to make sure that we're handling this gear properly. And some of those procedures are just as important as the equipment itself. Uh, so that's readiness. Also, I would like to say, we would like to not just count numbers of aircraft in availability and say that's readiness. It is well beyond a number. It is a capability inside the systems. These need to be full mission assets for the COCOMs and the, the nations that need them, nations plural, because uh, might be an FMS customer. Next one, frankly, is cost. Um, so affordability as a service decision, you know, what, what the, the department decides they can afford on the program side and execution, it's controlling the cost and driving it down. Not just on the procurement, I think uh, probably as important, more important, uh, you know, in my perspective is the ONS cost. So that's where I do want the glossy brochure promise on the 53K and the maintainability because on the Marine assets, uh, and you've heard the commandant, he's 
pretty uh, he's pretty dynamic and he's forward thinking. We will not be taking all the black boxes off these aircraft and shipping them back to a vendor site uh, if we're in our distributed operations, Navy or Marine. That means we need capability on site, whether that's on an island or a ship. Okay, uh, next priority is execution for our programs across the board. And I do need industry's help. That's not just on our program offices. It's a collective thing. Uh, we need to live up to our promises, both from the government and from industry. Everybody wants stable requirements, stable funding. We're familiar with how the government budget process works. So uh, it, sometimes that's not ideal, but we do need to make sure we're executing to what we say, both on the government side and industry. And then the last one that's not really depicted here, but if you go to the next slide, it's on workforce. Um, and I think of it from an acquisition workforce in the program offices, but really no matter what we put downrange, there is a sailor or a Marine that's got to maintain it in a relatively austere environment on a pitching deck of a ship. You know, I've used this picture for years. It's, it's not the newest aircraft, and I'm sure that guy is not as young as he was there hanging on, but it's the same thing that goes on the ship every day. And if you look at what we ask our sailors and Marines to do forward, that's what we need out of the gear is almost to be as rugged as they are and quite frankly, less demanding. I would, the, the workload in the, the cockpit workload in a 53 K is greatly reduced from the 53 echo. I need that to be true for the workload for our maintainers on every one of our platforms. And so we're working closely with NAVSUP whether it's a PBL uh, pushing forward on some of our programs on V22, enhancing the market basket on the C1, uh, not the C130, but the, the H60, which has sort of the, the gold standard of PBLs. We're still working on all of the sustainment actions out there on the workforce. Okay, with that, I will answer questions. She's gonna bring you the mic. By the way, I watched the videos yesterday. I'm surprised that you have the first question. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Steve Trumbull, Aviation Week, uh, and thank you for the for the opportunity. Um, but just on PMA 276 and the optimization with the Venn diagram you talked about, as I I mean as I understand it, you know, you, uh, Aura is high speed uh, attack utility replacement. Um, FELMS is uh, long endurance maritime surveillance for ASW. And MUX is ISRNT long range. Uh, how, how do you optimize those three? Uh, and I mean, what, what kind of ideas are you thinking about? Well, so it, it's an excellent question. It does not mean that they will all be the identical platform. Uh, and some of the systems in the aircraft may not be the identical platform. And I would expand even your the three that are listed here. Oh, actually, MUX isn't listed here, but the three that we just talked about into the Army systems. We are closely watching what the Army is doing. Doesn't mean that we're on identical paths, uh, obviously timelines, funding, but there is a great synergy between the services, the teams that are working it. At NAVAIR, we have literally, it's the same team and humans that are, well, I, I'm off that diagram, that are working those two programs. Um, so they are looking at all of the requirements in there to go, is it a subsystem? Is there a difference in, uh, in some cases, it's a weapons capability, how we would employ. So I, I don't, that probably doesn't answer your question, which I should have said up front. I don't promise to answer your questions, but I'll address them all. Thank you, sir. Dan Parsons with Vertical Magazine. Uh, with the VH92, what still has to happen before that inner service are you waiting for aircraft or is it simply a white house military office decision at this point okay so i think your question just i'm going to repeat it to make sure i got it right uh you're asking with respect to the vh92 are we, are we waiting on the number of aircraft to come in or on the commissioning program from the white house well it's a combination of both uh but the 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 real takeaway is the squadron and the program are ready today. So we have enough aircraft for the, you know, the initial usage. 
We have enough pilots that are trained. We have the support equipment. We have all that kind of stuff. Over time, we will continue to deliver the programmer record. So we have delivery of two VH-92s imminent. Those would be the first two off the production lines uh, that will go into the service. And we are working closely with the headquarters Marine Corps on their transition plan because they have to worry about training of pilots, threes, sixties, and 92s on how we're gonna phase out and phase in. And then with the White House on a commissioning program, if you will, and I think that will all coalesce over the next few months and you will see the VH-92s in service shortly. Morning, sir. Antoine Wright, uh, Boeing Statement. Um, you mentioned that the H-60 program is the gold standard for PBLs. Is that something you're looking at implementing across some of your other type model series platforms, such as the V-22 over time? Yeah. Well, I think you probably knew the answer to that when you were asking. It's behind, it's behind where it should be. Uh, my personal opinion, we should already have that up and going. I'm working closely, not just with the program office that's implementing that, but with NAVSUP uh, to, if you will, expand the market basket uh, beyond potentially the, the make only parts that I think we have, because we already have PBL arrangements on the V-22. Uh, I would like to see it larger, more robust, and I definitely would like to get Bell Boeing, Bell and Boeing, under uh, a fixed price as opposed to a cost and incentivize you guys to not only get down the cost, but to increase the reliability of the components. I think PBLs do a disservice by the end in L, and so people think that's only logistics and spare parts. Uh, the E in engineering somehow needs to be inserted in that, and the, the lesson learned on the H60 is you're incentivized in industry, not just to have them on the shelf, but the longer they're flying, the, the better incentive it is. That's the goal. That should be the goal when we produce a brand new aircraft and when we make the improvements over time. In, improve the reliability. Hey, good morning, sir. Uh, Joe Wade from Syscon North America. With respect to your four priorities that you've articulated this morning, what do you see the role of data analytics being specifically modeling and simulation to assist you in getting to or meeting your end state goals. Okay, so I think your question, because uh, just to make sure I heard correctly, was with respect to the, the goals, data analytics, modeling and sim, how does it play? So I know that you know, uh, I'm a huge advocate of uh, not just acquiring data, but actually using it. I don't think we optimize that today. We have a lot of data, uh, whether it's off the V-22 or any of the other uh, platforms, but it's do we put it in the right systems to make the correct actions? Um, so we are making huge strides. We, not as a programs, but in the NAVAIR NAE community on the data analytics. I think there is a, a certainly on the engine, engineering side, on the model-based systems engineering to go in to roll into that. But I will tell you, that is where we need to go the predictive turns into proactive so that we can make those uh, proactive things so it plays a huge role it's a combination of industry as well as government what we can't have is a stovepipe solution from each company and or each program even if they're organic uh and we need to look across the board uh, and i i think of that today when we have challenges, uh, whether it's a notice of escapement or anything else, immediately what I want to know is not just the impact on the program, but all of the programs in DOD-wide. So I think think we have more work to do. I know there are a lot of people working on it, and there's some great solutions. Hi, sir. Uh, James Drew from Northrop Grumman. Uh, just out of personal interest, uh, how did you end up with the C-130 for the EXX? And uh, also out of personal interest, uh, any discussions with Australia uh, on the FVL and, and your work you're doing on the Navy side? Okay, so your first question on uh, just a personal interest, how did we end up with the C-130 for EXX? I will tell you that was not a whim. 
that's a lot of data and analysis on our mission and the operations of how we would conduct the mission, as well as, so there was an AOA done, looked the scope, the breadth and depth, and uh, that is the direction that we have moving forward. I think that it will uh, not do the mission in the same way the E6 did it, but it is the same mission. Well, I'll subset that. We are only taking the Takamo portion of what is done in an E6. The E6 also does uh, an admin cap portion. That's going to be handled over by the Air Force. So this is the Navy only mission. It So therefore, we could go to a smaller aircraft. And uh, for reasons that I won't go into, that we believe that is the ideal aircraft for the forward. Now our goal as the program office, their challenge is to prove out through the risk reduction that they can get it all done, put it in that aircraft, and we can safely execute and perform that mission, and then transition that as soon as possible. You asked me a second question with Australia on future vertical lift. Uh, so I, I think you're familiar that, well, I said it earlier, we, we have cooperative program offices, P8 and H60. Uh, I deal frequently with my counterparts uh, in Australia, and I think there's an opportunity there, but it's generally at the service level, whether that's the Marine Corps or the Navy dealing on that level, as opposed to the acquisition programmatics at this time. But the requirements, that would be that would be an interesting thing that I don't currently have visibility into if there were unique requirements to put in that VIN diagram to look at opportunities. So, Any other questions? We're good? I think we're good. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you being here, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you.